Good afternoon, everyone. It is my pleasure to introduce our um, panel. Actually, thank you so much, uh, first to Marilyn and to the um, Hardship Advisors for making sure that we are able to experience year number three. Uh, to our sponsors, of course, we wouldn't be able to do any of this without the sponsorships. So I'll add my thanks to that. And then the Hardship alumni who have been with us either two or three years, we've really appreciated the, the kinship that's been formed over this time. Um, I am also proud that today, what you see in terms of this presentation is the power of allyship. So, you know, um, just this morning we've been talking, or this afternoon, it feels like this morning, we've been talking about relationships and how important that is. Um, these three um, colleagues sitting before you, are, we're all bonded. We have supported each other over the past several years, and we have shared ideas that helped us get through very difficult times, and of course, we've also celebrate, celebrated many victories as well. Today, we are proud to share with you, again, the power, the power of partnerships. So much has been laid before us as um, educators to take care of. And during this very difficult time, it's really important that we focus just as um, we talked about earlier this morning or earlier today, how we build the kind of relationships that help us serve our students and our staff well. So today we'll talk about how we got the work done and also how we continue to learn from one another and with one another. It is really about the power of allies. So I'm gonna ask my, each of my colleagues to um, talk a little bit about their major partnerships often um, ex not only established but also probably strengthened based on the pandemic. We received it as an engraved invitation to uh, do even more for our students but also um, an opportunity perhaps to start some new partnerships. So today with me is Valerie Cave. She is superintendent of Carlton County Schools and she'll tell you a little bit about her district and the power, the partnerships that have proven very powerful for her. Vivian Atkin is who is a superintendent of Glendale United Unified uh, School District. And then Teresa Rouse who will talk to you about partnerships in uh, Joliet Public Schools. And we'll start um, with letting you know our why for partnerships. And I think this is something you all share. Certainly, through our partnerships, we've seen improved academic outcomes. We definitely have seen an improvement in our student and staff well-being. And as someone said when they stood earlier, I think it was our last uh, contributor, because we've had improved academic outcomes and improved student and staff well-being, we also have improved well-being of our families. Whenever there is less concern about the children, we generally see less concern among our other stakeholders, including parents. And then, of course, we've seen lots of behavioral benefits. I would say that we probably can teach the airlines and some other people some lessons about how we manage some of the behaviors that we are seeing in the public. And while we struggle on our own, you know, we do recognize that we have we have ways of managing some of these things that we're seeing. And then, of course, we've seen um, better outcomes as well with college and careers. So I'm going to ask my colleagues to start. Um, Valerie, we'll start with talking to you about Colleton County Public Schools and what's been happening. We've allocated about six minutes for each of us to talk through this. <laughs> And then we um, hope to be able to answer some questions at the end. But if not, we'll be able to talk with you over our break in our time here. Thank you. So hello to everyone. I'll tell you a little bit about Colleton County School District. Um, we are a rural school district in South Carolina. I have about 5,100 students, um, about 900 employees, and my demographics range, we're probably about 50-50% African American and, and, and Caucasian. Um, I have a few um, Hispanic children as well. 
Partnerships are critically important because we are a rural school district. My district is about 1,300 square foot square feet in, in, in mileage. So therefore, um, my children travel on the bus about 32 miles. As I have one family that travels in that far to come to school. So when they go home in the afternoon, there's really nothing to do. So partnerships are critically important. We have college and university partnerships. I have an early college partnership where I have um, um, several of the local universities. Although we are a rural, we do have extensions of the University of South Carolina as well as Clemson University. I know everyone has heard of those two universities there. They provide a transition to teaching program as well as do some tutoring services as well as come in and work with some of our athletic um, 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 entities in our school district as well. They do some coaching with our principals because they recently did a um, leadership grant with our school district. We also have Arts Now and Arts Grow. Arts Now is a partnership where they come in and do integration lessons with our school district and um, three of our schools. In a rural school district, it's very important for me to identify a thematic kind of based um, school in all of our schools because our, our parents work in Charleston and Berkeley County and Walt and um, Beaufort and Savannah and Columbia. So they want to take their children with them. I want the children to stay with me. So it's really important that I create an enduring kind of environment for my children to be able to stay there. So through arts integration and arts grow, I'm able to bring in various partnerships to create those types of environments where they can experience various types of the art forms. Then I have First Lego League, First Lego League as well as um, coding for the little people. I have an early learning center there where all of the children there learn how to code. What a wonderful way for our, our children to be able to learn a career that maybe one day they'll be able to do some web-based um, designing. Then my ministerial alliance, is that my six minutes? Okay, I heard something was, okay, <laughs> yes. So then I have the Ministerial Alliance. That is, that's a really important group. I don't know about you, but I cannot make it every day without my ministers. They come in, they work with my children. If I need to get a message out, they are a strong group of individuals who really, really um, pray for our schools. They come in and they support my boys as well as my girls, as well as my, my parents and, and, and my staff. Um, South Carolina um, has started something called the South Carolina After School Alliance. Um, in the rural community, it's important for my children to have something to do after school. So we're training our in-school um, teachers to go out into the community and train our partners in the community to be good after-school tutors. And if they have a school-based or they have a community-based after-school program, we want that program to be an extension of our school environment. So they are training them to be great after-school program providers. Um, and then in a community where it's very rural, children don't get adequate health care. So health care is extremely important. Um, I have a number of children who don't have their immunizations up to, up, uh, up to speed, and um, they have to be released from school because they can't come to school every day. And I bring the health care to them. So I have mobile health care um, in my schools, um, as well as I have an on-school site health clinic as well for my children so they can get the immunizations. But also with that, I have the mental health services that come in from the University of, the Medical University of South Carolina as well as a local coastal mental health there. And then last but not least, the business partnerships are critical because our Chamber of Commerce also provides a lot of support for incentives for my children through Terrific Kid. And then with our Colleton Memorial Library, I'm trying to build the literacy rate. Why am I doing that? Because every one of my schools is on the state-identified state underperforming list. So what better way to be able to build literacy than to partner with our, our local library? Hope I've given a little bit. Good afternoon, everyone. How many of you have a California connection of some sort? There you go. So when I speak about Glendale, you kind of know what I'm talking about. 
So um, this is my fourth year as the lucky superintendent of Glendale Unified School District. We are 24,500 students strong. We have more than 50 languages spoken in our school district. We have seven dual immersion programs. We have 50% of our students on free and reduced meals. So when you hear about Glendale from a distance, and someone shared with me, she used to watch TV as a child and on game shows. They were either from Burbank or from Glendale. <laughs> and I thought that was um, quite interesting because it is very different, and I hope so many of you will be able to come and visit. Uh, my doors are wide open for you. So Anne convinced me to come to this trip, and I was I trust Anne with my life, so I said, perfect. Of course, why wouldn't I? And then she said, oh, and you uh, will be presenting with us. And I said, I thought I was coming to relax and self-care, but now there's the pressure of being amongst you fabulous leaders. And I've already learned so much in the day and a half, and I would not want to be anywhere else but here with all of you. So when the pandemic hit, it was my ninth month as the superintendent in Glendale, and I had spent 34 years in LA Unified, which is the second largest school district in the United States. So I went to the third largest in LA County out of 80 school districts. And I know Melissa, a partner of mine in El Segundo, knows what I'm talking about. We in California have different minds. We believe about, we, uh, believe us, um, that every student should be safe, but then we have governors who are going out to expensive restaurants and making our lives more difficult as we're trying to implement all the guidelines that our public health department has uh, promoted. So one of the complex uh, issues around California now pivoting to a serious conversation is that uh, many of the guidelines were not requirements, but they were recommendations. So what happens when you have recommendations in a community that is split of the no maskers and maskers of schools should be open every day to we should shut down schools for as many years as possible. <laughs> you as a superintendent and your team uh, have to make sure that every child is still receiving their aspirational educational uh, experience with the support of the adults in the system. Um, so we, formed healthcare partners, advisories, 12 hospitals throughout our uh, region. We met with them once a month virtually. So every time a decision was made based on LA County Health Guidelines, I would have a meeting with these individuals uh, virtually prior to my board meetings and consult with them of what seemed to be a reasonable recommendation and what was just not doable in a school system. So the good news is, because we knew many of our kids were safer at school than they would be at home, being with multiple families in very small dwellings, we never really shut down school. And we found, a, we navigated the system to have learning pods in our schools. And that was really significant for our, most, our elementary students, and particularly families that did not speak English at home. So even though we distributed thousands and thousands of devices and hotspots. If they were at home and three other kids with, with their device were in the same room and the parents were not there or not able to help them, that didn't work. So we in our elementary schools kept our schools open uh, and our teachers did not want to come to work at school. So they were teaching from home, but we hired classified staff that were facilitating the work in the classrooms. And I have to say attendance was incredible. And I have to say that transmissions did not occur at school site. So we had a lot of COVID uh, from home or in the community, but we also monitored it by partnering with the uh, medical company, Vital Medical, and we spent a significant amount, millions of dollars in having them on our campuses. We tested five days a week for two years, uh, and we just pivoted this summer to three general locations at our three high schools. But that allowed us to continue to maintain the attendance necessary for our students to continue to learn. Our partnership with our county health department, our county school districts, and of course, Department of Mental Health were for front and center because the number of students on, that demonstrated suicidal ideation 
the st amount of adults that we had to do health checks on was incredibly important, even though it seemed that people were checking in, but we could tell that they were struggling. So we've hired a significant number of mental health professionals, psychiatric social workers, PSA counselors, and those are the ways in which we've spent our funding, and I'm pleased to say we have spent every dollar. So we did have the um, Deputy Secretary of Education on a, um, on a trip across the country to see how ESSER funds were spent, and we were able to share best uh, promising practices that now exist, and our request was to increase base funds, so districts like mine that are right in the middle they're not 100% free and reduced, 50%, but still the promising practices apply to every student and every family. And we hope to be able to move the legislative agenda. Um, the city agencies, of course, our fire department um, and our police department, uh, we were the main vaccination site for all the young people in our city. So we had more than 38 vaccination clinics and we opened it up to the community so families would come with their parents and grandparents. And it was an amazing experience from a leader's perspective. I don't know if I could do it again. It helped that I didn't know what was happening next month <laughs> <laughs> because uh, when Omicron hit and for nine days uh, we were testing students and adults, thousands of individuals around the blocks in our community and traffic was being managed by the police, but we were the ones there from 7 a.m. until 10 o'clock at night. And then if someone arrived at 10.01, we would still take them because we knew uh, they needed us. It's really incre incredible how important it is to build relationships. I regretted the fact that I didn't know everyone in my community because it had only been the first year in the job. But I can say now without reservation that I've gotten to know everyone so well that I know where to go to uh, should we ever have a challenge. On the tutoring piece as it connects to the last conversation, I wanted to share that we introduced student tutors and we call them super tutors and we pay them $14 an hour and they're happiest employees that I have. I want you to <laughs> so if you have an A uh, in a course at the high school level, um, we uh, they can do it on um, virtually. And they, in the summer now, are also in the classrooms. And it's been incredible. There are 120 strong. And the teachers are writing um, comments about them that they can't live without the super tutor anymore. And the student tutor, uh, students who are benefiting from it really are building relationships that are also mentoring and guidance, big brother, big sister, uh, family relationships that I would not have had with any adult. I think I have exhausted my time. Thank you for allowing me to share. Thank you. Dear. So, yep. Okay. So um, the the reality of the fact that Anne is an OG and we're all three first year participants in Power Trip. Um, watch out for those OGs out there. Just saying. Anyway. <laughs> Joliet Public Schools, District 86. In Illinois, just so you know, everybody's got a number. Some people only refer to themselves by number, which makes me crazy, because I've only been in the state. This has just started my seventh year. And they'll say, well, we're with District 82. And I'm like, and that tells me nothing. Um, but anyway, um, Joliet Public Schools, Joliet, Illinois, um, as I said last night, home of the Blues Brothers. So they're actually coming to have a concert soon at the old prison. So anyway. Um, the trivia that, pers that persists is crazy. We're a district that is pre-K to eight. God bless all of you who have high schools. I don't want them. I don't need them. I'm happy with my pre-K to eight. Um, we have about 10,000 students across 21 buildings, about 1,600 staff, 65% Hispanic Latino, about 24% African American, and the rest white or other. Um, the district has gone through, the city has gone through a lot of dramatic change demographically over the last several years and um, still has not adjusted mindset to the wonderful world of equity. Just saying. So we're doing some fun work. Um, we have a river that runs down through the middle of Joliet that has five drawbridges 
And uh, back in the day, they used to raise the drawbridges to keep one group on the one side that they couldn't come to the other side. For days on end, just saying. But anyhow, we're working to break down some of those uh, walls between people and groups in our community. Um, I'm just starting my seventh year in Joliet. Um, I spent 22 years in California prior to that. Um, and so this is my 13th year as a superintendent. Um, some people in California, they're like, why on God's green earth did you go to Illinois? I grew up in central Indiana and I wanted to get closer to family. So you do what you do when family is involved, I guess. So, but I still have my deep connections with my California buddies too. Anyway, so partnerships in Joliet, um, critical. When you have 100% um, of your student population is on free breakfast and lunch, not reduced, but free. Uh, poverty level is extremely high. Uh, a lot of multi-generational homes. Um, COVID hit us hard. We were remote, fully remote for the entire first year of the pandemic. Once we went home, March of 2020, we were out until the beginning of this past school year. We tried to bring people back in one or two days a week. Just come back one or two days a week. Parents were, they were afraid. They, they just couldn't do it. The state mandated we do state testing that spring. I'm just like, really? But it had to be in person. I'm like, really? Okay. So we had, we were able to, to con about 30% of the, of the families to bring their kids in for state testing um, a year ago. And, um, you know, it's, I bless their hearts. Um, this last year was, um, I told my staff, it was like living the worst movie sequel ever. Think about the worst, think about the worst movie sequel you've ever seen. Okay, we lived it this last year. Okay, all of us did. Um, in Illinois, it wasn't just recommendations. Everything was a mandate. Everything was a you will, you shall do, uh, thou shalt do. And so we did, uh, much to the, just the stress of some of our families, um, some of the aspects of the mandates of the lovely COVID. So we're hoping to start this next school year with a much more positive outlook and um, be able to see everyone's full face when they come to school as opposed to only half of it. So partnerships. With the poverty level in our, in our community, it's really important that we have before and after school partnerships to help with care for our students um, because otherwise they're at home by themselves and uh, no one is there with them. So the YMCA is one of our biggest partners when it comes to before and after school care. They have um, situations set up at all of my elementary schools. Um, then they've created a teen reach program that works after schools at the junior highs. Um, my families are, are they, they claw over everybody to try to get to be, to be involved in the YMCA program because it allows them to have early drop off but also late pickup and their child is supervised as opposed to at home on their own. We have um, great partnerships with community centers throughout the city of Joliet, uh, the Spanish Community Center. I'm actually on the board. Uh, we do a lot of work with them. There's several others that work for, in various aspects of the community. Um, the community is somewhat still divided, but uh, through these partnerships with the community center, we're trying to weave them back together. We also work with our clergy quite closely. Uh, I know Valerie mentioned her clergy partnerships as well. Um, I, they've actually, several of the churches have opened up their pulpit on Sunday mornings. I go speak. It's all good. You want, you want to welcome me to your pulpit? I'm going to be there. And I'm going to tell you what we're doing in school and how you can help us. Um, and it's been interesting. I've been back to several. Um, each year they, they asked me to come back um, to just update them on what's happening at the schools. Um, sometimes I feel like I'm preaching the sermon because I'm getting the amens and the, you know, everything out there as I'm talking, I'm like, okay, um, you know, and I wrap it up with a song. I may not sing as well as my friend here, but I try. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, it's all about those community connections. Um, no, matter, no matter how um, wealthy or non-wealthy the community is, we have to have those partnerships. And what I've found in Joliet, that's been the best way to help raise the image of the district. Because when I first went to Joliet, what I heard from colleagues around the area, oh, you're going to Joliet. Oh, you're going, I'm like, what, what does that mean? You know, I'm there to serve no matter what, but we're raising the image of the, of the, the, the district by having these community partnerships be so strong. This year with our ESSER money, we're doing a, a big push on a Grow Your Own program uh, for our paraprofessionals to become certified teachers. We are having a heck of a time 
filling positions. There are districts around us that are paying teachers a $9,000 signing bonus if they're bilingual. And I'm like, would you stop it? They're stealing all my people. Um, but you know, I keep, I keep reminding people, our benefit plan is better than theirs. Um, but they, you know, we're gonna we could keep bleeding people if we don't do something. So we started this Grow Your Own program. So we'll, we'll actually be using ESSER dollars to pay for classes and certification for paraprofessionals to become teachers, for teachers to get additional certifications. Um, and this will follow through uh, while we have the ESSER money and then hopefully beyond. Uh, we ended up with uh, probably about 50 people who applied to begin the program. So we'll see if they all follow through. They do have to have a commitment to the district beyond their program. Um, but we're, you know, keeping it, keeping it real, keeping it moving, trying to help them um, increase their skills and, um, and abilities so that we can have a stronger population. I don't know about you, but I love the career path piece. I had about 23 shifts on my side administrator teams this year, and only two of them ended up being external people joining the team. The rest were all internal advancements. You know, teacher leaders becoming academic advisors, or academic advisors becoming assistant principals, assistant principals becoming principals. And it's such a strong administrative team that way. And that's that strength in the community as well. We have a district equity committee reaches out to all of the uh, partnerships across the, the city. NAACP is highly involved with us in that, in that work. Um, the National Hookup of Black Women, big, strong connections with them. Uh, the board is fully invested in our equity work, which keeps us moving forward. Um, are we there yet? No. I keep reminding all of the staff, equity is a journey that is lifetime. It's not about checking off a box on a page. We will be working on this the rest of our lives because we have to. Um, I had a principal, a Puerto Rican principal come to me when we first started our equity journey at the, the first year, and she said, I gotta ask you a question, but it sounds really awkward. And I'm like, okay. It's just you and me in the room, it's all good. She said, why did it take a white woman coming here for us to have this conversation about equity? And I said, I don't know, but we're moving forward. I'm not gonna look backwards, but we're gonna, we're gonna move forward because every child deserves to have what they need, not just what we think they need. So we have to, be able to identify that and really meet their needs. So um, Joliet, we're a work in progress, and we are moving, moving, moving. And as long as I maintain partners and allies like these ladies here and all of you, that'll help me be strong to help make that, that movement forward. So thank you so much. You. So you will hear some uh, consistent themes. Uh, my colleagues and I, as well as many of you, have found lot, a mine, a gold mine of people out in our community who simply will work with us if we, if we just ask. Um, Savannah Chatham County Public Schools is a city county district. It is located on the coast of Georgia. And if you haven't been there, I invite you to join us. We are the 10th largest school district in the state. There, the others are in the metro, Atlanta metro area. So we're the big people on our side of the state. And um, I feel very strongly that um, much of what we have uh, to offer to our students and to our families are very often the envy of what is happening in the metro area, maybe because of where we are and the closeness of our community. We serve about 37,000 students and we employ 5,600 people. And that really allows our 55 schools to operate in a way that um, enjoys or uh, facilitates very strong um, relationships. We do see each of our buildings as a way for our students to formulate good um, relationships with the adults in the building and those in our community. I find um, I'm in my sixth year as superintendent there and I'm a product of the system, moved away and then came back and found that many of the things that we wanted to accomplish as a district, we were not able to do simply because we did not have the resources to do it really nice place to visit, but I will just tell you the reality of serving um, our students who are, 58% of them are African American, 33% uh, of them are Caucasian, 9% include our growing Hispanic community. And one of the things that we recognize by serving um, a school population or district population where nearly 70% of the students are uh, 
receiving or eligible for free and reduced lunch. Many, many, many needs. So I'm the kind of person, I'm like, a, like I said yesterday, if you come into the room with me and you ask me what I need, I'm gonna tell you and I'm gonna work with you until I get it. So I'm really, really, really big on partnerships. You heard every one of us talk about the YMCA. We just could not make it without the YMCA. Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts of America, you know, they're still germane to what we do. They certainly provide great services for our kids. Because I'm an arts person, can sing a lick, can draw, can do any of that. I rely on our arts community uh, to really provide valuable service. Savannah Music Festival, which draws people from all over the world, provides a program all year long where we really focus on making sure that our littlest ones our big ones also enjoy learning about music and see themselves as being a part of the music community. The pandemic allowed us to expand that. Um, Savannah Music Festival in particular offers a program for K-2 students where they're introduced to different genres of music. And what's most exciting for us is that they involve our teachers the curriculum is really built around it, and the young people twice a year get an opportunity to come and meet the various artists. So they get on the school bus, they're singing the whole way there, they come to the um, concerts. It is nothing more exciting than seeing a kindergartner who's in her little bubble coat and she's dancing the entire and singing the entire performance, but learning the vocabulary words associated with those genres of music, just as an example. Over the pandemic, we started a jazz academy and we started it with our middle schoolers. One of the things that was so exciting was the having to do it uh, virtually invited us to have students from all across the world to be a part of that jazz academy. When I say all across the world, I literally mean all across the world. And so many of the people who are performing with us from different countries also were a part of that whole jazz academy. They had their first big concert in our biggest uh, park this summer with 8,000 participants there to see them perform. They are sixth, seventh, and eighth graders and some fifth graders who are performing jazz. Awesome. Wouldn't have been possible without the um, Savannah Music Festival is my partner. Loop it up Savannah, oh my gosh. Wonderful, wonderful everything. They take all items, regular everyday items, and they go into our schools and work with our young people to experience artwork. So art for them can happen morning, before school, during school, after school, on the weekends, holidays. Summertime, they are a really important group that really works very much based on community contributions. And so we support them as well, but they have touched the lives of thousands of children. We couldn't do what we do without the help of Curtis V. Cooper Health Services. They roll the services right up to the school door. So for our neediest communities, if we can't get parents to take the kids in, to get their medical services. Curtis V. Cooper rolls right up. Parents sign up. You know, if Kathy needs to have attention to her dental caries, which, by the way, dental caries was our major issue, that, that child can walk right out of the door, right into the van, and get the services that they need. We paired up with the Lynx Incorporated on a dental health program so that we would prevent some of those carries by focusing on tooth brushing, taking care of your teeth, and also healthy eating. And then, of course, we have the APEX program, which is state-based, but it focuses on bringing services, again, right up to the school door for mental health counseling. And we've expanded from six sites now to 12 in our neediest communities. And trust me, neediest communities is not dictated by poverty. Neediest communities, in this case, are where our students are um, reporting major concerns, and that is due to um, suicide ideation, um, drug use, whatever the needs are. If the needs are heavy, 
that's where we are. And then St. Joseph's Candler um, Health Systems helped me meet a need. Um, the president of the hospital met with me and said, oh, what do you need? What do you need? I'm like, I need a health clinic. I have the space. Let me show you. Within six months, in one of my high schools where the focus is on health and allied services, we now have a health clinic that is run in, co in collaboration with St. Joseph's uh, Candler Systems. They serve the immediate community and the school and the school district, and they offer services from health checks to vaccines to vaccinations to any of the kind of screening services that are useful. So people in that community who did not have immediate access to health services can walk right over to the high school and get their needs, get their needs met. And last year, First Lady um, Biden came to town and she visited with the young people that are in that school, that are working in that clinic. And what an honor for them to be recognized in that way. And then finally, I will talk about America's Second Harvest Food Bank, which really offers wonderful services to our families. We were able to establish 28 food pantries in our schools to serve not only the families in those schools, but also the families who live in the immediate neighborhoods. So they roll right up or walk right over and get their boxes of food either for the day or for the weekend. And that allows us to deal with the um, food insecurity issues. And then finally, Gulfstream, um, which of course makes some of the biggest jets ever, custom jets. Georgia Ports Authority, which is the second, I would say third, but getting to be second largest port in the United States, an international paper, large firms which really provide great services to our students, most importantly through internships and, and apprenticeships. We want our students to be able to leave from their classroom and be able to walk right into um, jobs that are high wage and high demand. Those are just a sample of some of the partnerships that we have, but I wanted to make sure that you knew how much we value, thank you Kim, how much we value partnerships. Our work can't, we can't do it without having the courage to go up and say, what can you do to help us? The children belong to all of us. And the only way we're going to be able to do that is to elicit some partnerships. I say to people who say to me, oh, because I talk all over about partnerships. We don't have a lot of big businesses in our community. First of all, you as an organization can employ your own students. And that's what we do. I'm not going to ask you to hire my kids if I'm not willing to hire them. So I hire my own. My own. But, in, but then whatever you're doing, I'm asking you, how can I partner with you to give greater services to our students and our families? We are open to having more conversations about how we do it, but I would bet the, the partnerships that you have, if we shared them all in this room, would really be an inspiration to people who think we just run schools. We do more than that. We open the door by asking other people to support the work that we do. The children belong to us all. Thank you for allowing us to share. And Kim, is, who is an intrepid timekeeper, um, lets us know that we have about six minutes left if there are any questions. My question is for Vivian, regarding the supercuders or the student tutors. Could you share a little more about that? So uh, we looked at their grades. And they were also recommended by their teachers, and we have them at all of our high schools. And then we have a training program for them that is online, and we also pay them for the training. And um, I certainly am happy to send you additional information. More than happy to please send me an email or text me. It's vekchian at gusd.net. It's E-K-C-H-I-A-N and happy to do it. I have to say it's been really important. Student Voice has been incredible 
critically important for all of us. So it started with the idea that we had student voice panels across of our high schools, and they were as unsophisticated the first year prior to the pandemic of we want more soap in our bathrooms, to really the discussions around equity and diversity. And uh, we, Melissa knows, because she reads common papers, uh, huge discussions in our community around our transgender students and our ability to see the, ourselves in their shoes and the ability of our youngest students who are transitioning to be able to also have access to curriculum. So we've done an entire novel adoption program that has really turned our books away from what they used to be to an introduction that our parents and community members are getting used to. So um, giving students a voice and their ability to really lead the school district has been instrumental from my perspective and every opportunity we have to give them the keys to the kingdom, we do and they never take advantage of it in a bad way. Actually, they're becoming role models at our community college level. So email me if you would like more information on that. Thank you. Well, I'll tell you what we do. We, um, we actually feature our partners. So we have our partners come in and we do a video with them and then we run those on our website. So if Kathy is my partner, no one knows that Kathy is my partner perhaps. So we talk with Kathy about her business, what, why her business is important to the economy of our community and why she chooses to partner with us. This great publicity for them and great publicity for our teachers and our students who are involved with them. And then the second thing we do is we have a business partner recognition ceremony every year that we, um, is highly publicized, it's very public, and we invite the partners to come. Of course, we make a lot of fuss over them, and then we also invite them to bring someone else um, that they think would be a good partner. That's what we do. Something that we've done is um, similar, is we invite them in. So people who are partnering with us, but people who are not as well. And so they get to, and we have like a, just like a round table conversation to talk about what the partnerships are, what, what are the possibilities. Um, that has led to some joint partnerships with some businesses working with us, as well as opening up a door. Um, not all of our, our families were able to get library cards for free because they lived in the township versus in the city. Um, and worked at, uh, we've actually got an arrangement with the library now where they can get their library card for free no matter where they live in our district. So it, it opens up a lot of different doors that way along the way, but invite them in. So may I just add, um, visibility is really important. I know that is one of the leadership moves that you all demonstrate all the time. I have a list of priorities and needs and asks. So. Um, I knock on their doors, I introduce myself over and over again, and then I also make it competitive. So I say, our GUSD students need to be globally competitive. So if Glenda Memorial now has a medical internship with Glenda High School, isn't it important for Glenda Adventists to give us also uh, clinics? And then they go to their foundations and they get us 125,000. And then I go to the county and say, but imagine we don't have these at the elementary level. Isn't that a shame? <laughs> because you know, health and wellness starts at the youngest student level. So um, it's, it's being convincing. And I think we all as leaders have learned to be convincing, particularly if it is about our kids. And then connections with parents. Always find out what they do and how they can be influencers. Some have large community groups that they belong to. So if you have your list and you carry it with you and make it incredibly visible, you'll be surprised as to not just resources in dollars, but resources in time that come your way. And uh, our students are worth investing in, so no one can leave my office until they do what we ask them to do, like <laughs> Anne said. I don't know about your board meetings, but my board meetings the last year have just been overcrowded and it's just been a complaint. 
Um, so instead of it being a complaint, I had a community spotlight. So with my partners, I would have the partners come in and um, um, just talk about the great things that they are doing at, um, for our school. So that was a way to turn around the perception of what community partners do and then to bring them in so that everybody who was there to complain um, could see the good things that the partners are doing. And then it brought other partners in as well so that they would want to be a part because everybody wants to be the center of attention. All right. One, one more, Kim. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. We enjoyed sharing with you and would love to share more. Um, I have to say, um, I, I love this experience because I think whenever we go away, we are renewed. And so um, I found this quote this morning and Kim is going to let me share. <laughs> Um, I will just say that within you, there is a stillness and a sanctuary to which you can retreat at any time. Thank you for enjoying this, this session and for when we looked at each of you, we saw your interest and your love and your support. So thank you. Thank you.